Good morning, y'all. Let's stand and begin to worship together this morning. How are we doing? I'm still waking up. <laughs> it's good to be here with you today. Um, yeah, it just feels like a good morning. It's a good morning to uh, gather together and worship and look to Jesus, look away from ourselves and look to him. As we continue to sing, um, I kind of want us to do something uh, a little different. We don't usually do this every week, but we're gonna read a corporate prayer together. Uh, it's a prayer of confession. Um, it's saying, God, we've 
we've messed up, we've fallen short. We don't, we can't be like you, we aren't perfect. Um, but your invitation is always gracious and kind. And so we thank you for that. So let's read this together. Lord Jesus, we have sinned times without number and been guilty of pride and unbelief and of neglect to seek you in our daily lives. Our sins and shortcomings present us with a list of accusations, but we thank you that they will not stand against us for all have been laid on Christ. Deliver us from every evil habit, every interest of former sins, everything that dims the brightness of your grace in us and everything that prevents us taking delight in you. Amen. Let's continue to sing. In the darkness, we were waiting without hope, without light, till from heaven you came running. There was mercy in your eyes. To fulfill the law and prophets To a virgin came the word From a throne of endless glory To a cradle in the dirt So we praise your name And praise the Father Praise the Son And praise the Spirit
The death for which all sin demands The sinless died for guilty men And though we give our hearts to mess He is our righteousness He has
is gonna come up and read scripture over us this morning. I'm reading from Acts 2, 42 through 47 and Acts 4, 32 through 37. This is the word of the Lord. And they devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that anything belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needing person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. Thus Joseph, who was also called by the, by the apostles Barnabas, which means son of encouragement, a Levite, a native of Cyprus, sold a field that belonged to him and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. All right. Well, good morning, church. Great to be together this morning. If you are new, my name is Matt Blackwell. I get to serve here at our Northwest Congregation. Uh, if you are joining us in one of our other congregations, so glad to be able to worship with y'all this morning. If you're joining us online, man, so great. I'm so glad that you're joining us. Hopefully we get to meet you at some point at one of our congregations here in Austin, Texas. Well, we have been working through a series this fall called Reviving Love. And if you've been tracking with us, we are moving our way through what does it look like for God to revive our hearts? And we recognize that we can't force revival, that revival is something that is a sovereign act of God, according to God's timing, purposes, and will. God does as he pleases, but there are some patterns historically and even biblically that we see that sort of lead the people of God towards a revived heart. And so we've talked about that over the course of our time. We say, when God's people experience significant pain and it leads them to collective prayer, and God answers that prayer with a unique expression or revelation of his spirit, it leads to the transformation of his people. So we see prayer leading to, uh, we see pain leading to prayer, leading to God's presence, leading to transformation. That's what we call revival. And that's what we're asking God to do. Because honestly, we felt number one, like we felt over the last 18 months to two years, we felt that collective pain. And we don't wanna stay there. We don't want to just want to sit in that. We want that prayer to prompt us, to move us toward, that pain to move us towards prayer, saying, God, we need you. We just sang that. We just prayed that. God, we need you here in our lives. And so we're asking God to do that, to stir us in a unique way, not just uh, an individual here or there, but really our entire community. God, would you restore us? Would you revive us? And that's what we want to look at this morning is what does it look like, not just for an individual here and there to be revived, but what if God revives us as a community, together uh, as God's people? So we're talking about revived community this morning. And when we talk about community, this is not one of those controversial subjects. Like we get to those from time to time as we work our way through the Bible. All of us think community is a good idea. 
We love the idea. We love the word community. We want more friends. Uh, we want more people to be in our lives who love us and laugh with us and cry with us and share with us. We're all like, yes, yeah, sign us up for that. But here's the problem. Uh, our ideal of community and our experience of community are often very different things. You feel that? We value relationships until we meet people. Uh, we're like, I think this would be awesome if everybody did what I want them to do when I wanted them to do it. Uh, community would be so easy. The world would be so easy to live in if everybody acted like I acted, valued what I valued, voted like I voted. Community would be amazing. Everybody else would be miserable, but I would be happy, right? That's kind of how we feel that we, we look at community because uh, we are all sort of these autonomous selves with self-bending hearts and when you put two autonomous selves with self-bending hearts into relationship, you're bound to have problems because not everybody agrees with you. Not everybody has your same perspective, your same uh, history. This, the, you don't see things the same way. And so we see challenge in relationship. It's been said like this, that there's only two problems in any marriage, the husband and the wife. Like that, that's it. That's the only two problems that you'll have. Now, if you were to take thousands of self-autonomous, self-heart-bending people and thousands of us, and you're to put us in one community called the Austin Stones, spread out across six congregations in the fastest growing, one of the fastest growing cities in the country, community gets complicated. And you feel some of that. But it's not just in large church. If you're in a small group, and you've got eight people in your living room, guess what? Community is complicated because people come with, with expectations and with challenges. And that's what, that's what happens when we enter into community. It's not like when you were a kid. Community when you were a kid was awesome and easy. Here, here's how you, be, you become friends with somebody when you're a kid. Are you a grown up? No. Do you like Dr. Pepper? Yes, we're best friends. That, like that's all it takes. We're in the same place, we're, we're, we're about the same age, we like to throw rocks, we'll ride bikes, we're friends. And then you grow up and, you, and life gets sort of complicated. And sin enters in and selfishness enters in and brokenness enters in and deceit enters in. And, and it, 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 all of a sudden you, you get to this stage and you're like, man, relationships are really hard. Like finding deep community is really challenging. And so this week I was trying to, I was trying my best to uh, do some online research, which is always fun to do, and, and just kind of see what, what markers are there from the way that community has changed over the last 18 months. I found a couple that were pretty telling. Uh, one Harvard study did a research study in 2018, so pre-pandemic, and they found that 20% of adults in the U.S. reported feeling lonely without significant social relationships. So 20% in 2018, that same study was done uh, in early 2021. That number jumped from 20% to 36%. It's a significant increase. If you were to ask young mothers, are you lonely without significant relationships? That number is 51%. If you ask young adults, are you lonely without significant relationship? That number is 61%. Loneliness in relationships have, 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 have become part of the ethos of our reality, that, that over the last 20 years, the number of men, the number of guys that said they have no close friends has quadrupled. We don't know how to engage. And statistics are one thing, but I know that the statistics have some bearing because I sit across coffee uh, tables from you and I see it in your eyes and I hear it in your stories. I talked to one guy just last week and he said, man, the, uh, since this pandemic, I've sort of forgotten how to be a friend and to make a friend. We just sort of forgotten how to engage socially and in community. And so why is community so difficult? Why is it so hard to, to, to actually live in this? Why do we simultaneously want really deep friendships, but we want people to stay out of our business? Why do we uh, sort of uh, get really close to people to a point, but then it starts feeling weird and awkward, so we find ourselves backing off? Why do we always blame everybody else in the community but never own our own stuff? Why is it that, that we, there, there's a group of us that are desperately seeking friendships and then there's this whole other group that are, are completely like, just leave me alone. Why do we find ourselves uh, really close in relationship, but then over time that the relationship sort of disintegrates and gets distance and you come to church on a Sunday and you're like, we used to be friends, but now we're not. I don't know how to engage with this. 
what's going on with our community? Is it just, is it just personality? Maybe. Some of us are introverts and some of us are extroverts. Is it, we live in Texas and we are rugged individualists? Maybe, could be, but I think it's much deeper than that. I think it's much deeper than that. Community is difficult and complicated, not just because of your personality. Community is difficult. All the way back at the beginning, we see the, the, the beginnings of a break in community. All the way back in, in the book of Genesis. So if you remember all the way back in Genesis chapters one and two, remember God creates Adam and he creates Eve and he's this beautiful garden. Remember he created Adam and what did God say? It's not good for man to be alone. So God creates community and Adam and Eve have this beautiful relationship, this wonderful community where they're with one another in their relationship with God and they're in the garden and they're newlyweds. And Genesis 2.25 says this amazing little phrase. It says they were naked and no shame. Can you even imagine what that would be like? Like those two words don't really go together in our understanding. Naked and shame are, uh, are, are, are synonyms almost for us. That they were in relationship, they were naked and unashamed means that they were fully known, fully revealed, and yet completely accepted. There's no body image issues, no pornography issues. There's no such thing as divorce, no such thing as adultery, just... Adam and Eve in blissful harmony with God and one another. And that lasted all of two chapters because Genesis three comes right after Genesis two. And we start to see these, this break in relationship. So Adam and Eve sin and, and we see this brokenness in their relationship. They, they move away from one another, away from God. Genesis four, the very next chapter, they have uh, two sons, one of the sons rises up and kills the other. So in Genesis three, we have sin. In Genesis four, we have murder. By Genesis chapter six, we read this, that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, that violence filled the land, that every intention of the thoughts of man's heart was only evil continually. So it doesn't take long to see relationships and community fractured. And then we come into a place where we want community and we find ourselves having a difficult time finding friendships. And we wonder, why is it so difficult to find friends in the office, to get to know my neighbors, uh, to, to be in community with people in my own family? Why, is this, why are relationships so difficult? And we do something, I don't know if we, we, we rationally do this, but I think we do this, is we think relationships are hard out there. They should be easy in here. So relationships are hard to find in the world that should be easy in the church. Because I hear you, you say this and I know what you mean. So no judgment. I hear you come, I say, hey, what brought you to church? And you'll say something like this. I came to find community. And I know what you mean, but I want to change your word. Because community is not the secret treasure that exists in the church that when you show up, you're like, oh, there it is. All of my best friends forever. Uh, this is what I've always longed for. Everyone loves me and, and doesn't hold me accountable to anything. Everyone acts like me, votes like me, looks like me. That, that's not a thing. Uh, we don't find community, we build community. Community takes effort, it takes energy, it takes sacrifice, it takes commitment, it takes vulnerability, it takes being willing to get your, 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 your brand new rug with coffee stains on it, it takes some awkward conversations, it's built because it's been broken. It's been broken in Genesis three and we live in the reality of that. And so we, we show up at church expecting community in sort of this prepackaged box, like here's all of your relationships. And when it doesn't happen like that, we fall into one of two categories. We either just sort of keep coming to church, but not really expecting to engage with anybody or we re-roll to a different church hoping to find better luck there. And honestly, some of you are here this morning in that category. And I'm not blaming, I'm not judging, but I'm just saying it, you're not gonna find a perfect community anywhere you go because there's no such thing as a perfect church, including ours. Because you look around and there's no such thing as a perfect community because there's no such thing as perfect people and you're not led by perfect pastors. And so the expectation in community is, man, what does it even look like to be in a church where I'm known and where I'm loved and where I'm growing. 
What does that even look like? Well, the good news is this. Uh, The good news is that God hasn't left you alone in that brokenness, in that loneliness, in that that frustration, that God is restoring and he's reviving community. That God's goal in bringing about community is to bring some some of that Eden-like reality to what community was supposed to be, that the church is supposed to be showing what that looks like in a broken, fallen world so that our relationships are, are more reminiscent of Eden than of earth. And so God is reviving community. The good news is we have a model for what that looks like. And so we see brokenness in Genesis three, we see revived community in Acts chapter two, and we see that starting in verse 42. Let's read this together. This is Acts 42 through 47. Here's what it says. It says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers, And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day, those who were being saved. So here's what I wanna do with with the short time we have left. I wanna show you four markers of revived community. And here's how I wanna do it. I wanna sort of contrast the broken relationships of Genesis three with the revived relationships of Acts two. So see how relationships are broken, but then see how God is bringing revival into our Community. So four markers. Number one, we see that a revived community moves us from isolation to devotion. From isolation to devotion. Okay, remember the first thing, the very first thing that Adam and Eve did, if you remember back in Genesis chapter three, they sin and what is the first thing that they do? They, they try to sew fig leaves together to cover their shame. Remember they were naked and unashamed? Sin enters the scene and now they're moving away from one another. They're isolating, they're they're covering themselves with fig leaves. Their brokenness presses them away from one another. The shame and the guilt moves them away. But in Acts 2, we see the opposite of that. We see them moving towards one another. It says, and they devoted themselves. Who's they? Who does that point to? The they is in the previous verses, the 3000 people that just came to faith. We talked about this last week. Remember Halem preached on repentance that uh, Peter preaches a sermon. 3000 people are cut to the heart. They say, brothers, what do we do? He says, repent, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you'll receive the Holy Spirit. So they, that's the they in, uh, in verse 42, they devoted themselves. I love that word devoted means ardently followed. They were constant, they were steadfast, they were persistent, they were persevering and they didn't give up. They were not casual in their care for one another. That this devoted community uh, wasn't devoted only when things were going well, but the minute things started getting weird, they stopped. That's not devotion. Well, they, they were not a devoted community based on convenience when it's really easy for me to be a part of community. They weren't a community based on the fact that they're in some sort of consumer relationship with one another. And if you bring this, then I bring this. And and that's the way that this works. It was a commitment, not a commodity. That's what this devoted community looked like. And, and, And Jesus is building and reviving a new community based on the way that he loves his church. He's saying, you love like that. Jesus doesn't love casually. Jesus loves with a covenant commitment to you. And he's saying, that's what it looks like to to love one another. Because let's be honest, the cross was not convenient, but the cross was a means by which you are loved, sacrificed for, given life. And then we come into church and that is the model that Jesus is giving us for what community looks like, to consider what it looks like to to give our lives. Because community is built on uh, shared experience. All communities built on some level of a shared experience. If you've ever, uh, college football's back up. If you've ever been in a, uh, you're college football fans, you've gone to an away game. 
You think, okay, we're gonna make this happen. We're gonna put on our jersey and we're gonna go to an away game and we're gonna watch uh, our team win in the away stadium. We did that when I was in college, uh, we went to an away game. And so we wore our jerseys. There was 90,000 other fans and a few hundred of our fans. And, and what do you experience when you see one of the, the, the fans wearing your colored jersey? You give them a head nod. Give him a fist bump. Like we're in this together. It's us against the world. I was literally standing in line at a, uh, at a concession stand. Uh, a guy comes up to me. I'm hat, I had my A&M hat on. Uh, he tries to light my hat on fire with his cigarette lighter. Luckily for me, I think he had had too many because I think he saw two of me and he kept missing me. Uh, but, but I'm like, okay, I don't need a soda that bad. I'm gonna go sit down, uh, right? But you see somebody sporting your jersey, your color, and you're like, yes. From across the stadium, there's 90,000 opponents and you see one maroon jersey and you're like, right here, we got it. Why? Why? Because we have some level of a shared community. I don't even know that person, but I feel connected to them in some way. So church, track with me here. We feel that in, in a football game where we feel some level of camaraderie and commitment and community. And then we come into church and we have the the ultimate shared experience, like literally a life and death experience. And I'm not being uh, 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 dramatic there that we've, been, we've died in Christ and we've raised to newness of life. And so when we see one another, we collectively believe that the cross was sufficient and that the grave is empty and that the kingdom is coming. And because of that, we say, yes, we're in this together. We, we might look different and vote different and spend different and live in different places and value different things, but we value Jesus. We believe in the cross. We, we believe in the resurrection. And that's enough to draw us into community to say we're, we're for each other. And so we're devoted to one another because Jesus is devoted to us. Number two, what else does a revived community do? Number two, we see that a revived community moves us from hiding to praising, from hiding to praising. The second thing that Adam and Eve did back in Genesis 3, remember number one, they covered themselves. Number two, they hid from God as if that was even a possible thing to do. They, it says they hide behind a, a tree, which is like me playing hide and seek with uh, you know, a five-year-old. Uh, they, they're hiding and giggling behind a tree and God walks into the garden of the cool of the day. What a beautiful picture. God doesn't come with lightning bolts in his hands. He walks in the garden in the cool of the day. This is after the fall. He says, Adam, what happened? And they're hiding from God. See, when, when we sin, our natural impulse is to move away, to hide. If you're a parent, uh, when your kids do something wrong, they don't look you in the eyes. They run to their room. They hide behind the couch. Why? It's a natural impulse. Adam did it. Eve did it, so do your kids and so do we. We wanna push ourselves. We are unworthy to be in the presence of God. God comes and finds us. Watch, watch something happens here in Acts 2. Instead of hiding, they're worshiping. Verse 42, and they devoted themselves to praying. Verse 46, day by day, they attended the temple together. Verse 47, with glad and generous hearts, they're praising God together. See, Acts 2 people weren't less sinful than Adam and Eve, but something changed their trajectory. Where Adam and Eve hid, the church pressed in. What changed the trajectory of, of the people of God? What moved them from hiding to worshiping? What's the love of God? It's the spirit of God. It's the, the grace of God that draws us in. I learned this in eighth grade that there's a difference between centrifugal and centripetal. So for three of you, you recognize what that is, but here's what that means. Remember, centrifugal moves away, centripetal moves towards. Sin is trend, uh, centrifugal. Sin moves us away from one another and away from God. Grace is centripetal. It draws us into one another and into God. So when we feel the pull away, it's because we aren't understanding the amazing grace that God is pulling us back in with. Community is bringing us back in. And so they worship together. They don't hide together. And look at what, how they worship. They, they're sharing stories. You know, one of the things that, that will, will help you grow in community as you hear other people's stories, 
how God's at work in their life. And it actually allows you to worship. You're worshiping with them. And so instead of individuals worshiping only in our story, when we hear one another's story, we worship together. When we sing, we don't just sing with, a, with an MP3 or on your phone in the car, although that's great, but this is different. It's different when we're singing together and collectively and we're hearing one another's voices praising together, that we're praying together, that we're praying. When, when, have you ever been in that place where you're, you're just, you've got no words left in your prayers? Like you prayed them out, you, you said all the things, or you're just so confused or frustrated or burdened, you can't even get words to, to make sense to God. And someone comes alongside you and prays with you and for you. And you're like, yes, that, that's, what I, that's what I'm asking God to do. Last year, uh, Shannon's dad was battling cancer and it was a long journey. And we were over at their house one night and we were in that spot where we'd prayed all the prayers. We'd asked all the things. And so we asked uh, Dave and Suzanne Barrett, Dave's uh, a good friend of ours, Dave and Suzanne are friends of ours, Dave's an elder here at the stone. And we said, would you just come and, and, and pray with us and pray for us? And they came and we sat in the living room with my father-in-law and my wife and them and they prayed. And, and it was as if, it was as if I was praying those prayers and they wept with us and we realized we're not alone. There's nothing magical in their prayers, but there's something special in their presence. That is, they sat with us and they prayed for us and they wept with us. It was nothing short of worship. We didn't have to hide. We didn't have to run. We said, would you come into our pain with us? And when they did, it, it created worship in us and in them. So God is reviving community and he's taking us out of hiding and bringing us into worship. Number three, what else does a revived community do? A revived community moves us from blaming to sharing. Moves us from blaming to sharing. Back in Genesis 3, remember what happens? God confronts Adam. Adam, what, what happened here? You remember how Adam responded? He says, the woman who you gave me. Now, I don't know what that felt like, but I can imagine Eve just feeling like she just got thrown under the bus. God walks into the garden of the cool of the day, Adam, what happened? And he's like, and he doesn't even use her name. It's the woman. It's her fault. Not my fault. I was just an innocent bystander. Now, by the way, if a serpent, guys, if a serpent starts talking to your wife in a garden, trying to get her to do something, I'm getting a machete and that thing is gone, right? By the way, so Adam is there and he's listening to this serpent deceive his wife. And then when God calls him on, he's like, no, nah, not my fault. I don't know the woman who you gave me. It's her fault. And God, I was good. I was on my own. I was here in the garden. And then you came along and gave me community. It's not even my fault. It's kind of your fault. You feel that when you get caught, when you get busted, when you get pulled over, when you're going uh, 60 and a 40 and you feel like it's the police officer's fault for pulling you over. You ever done that? You've been like, oh man, you don't know. This is, I'm mad at you for catching me. Uh, and that's what happens. It's what happens. We feel like it's always other people's fault. And then what happens? He goes to Eve and Eve says, what? The devil made me do it. It's not my fault. It's the serpent's fault and constantly blaming one another because blaming is the default position of a selfish heart. And a community that is broken is always blaming. It's always pointing the finger. It's never, never uh, owning our error, but a gospel-centered community says, no, no, it actually is my fault. But Jesus doesn't leave us there. It is my fault, but, but Jesus has taken my blame. It is my fault, but he's taken my shame and he's covered it. And because of that, instead of blaming, our response is sharing. I love uh, how Paul talks to the church in Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. It says, becoming affectionately desirous of you. We were ready to share with you, not only the gospel of God, but our own lives, our own selves. Because of our love for you, the church, we were willing to share not only the gospel, but our very lives 
See, when God revives community, we see the, the, the impulse isn't to blame other people, it's to share our lives with them. And we see that in Acts chapter two, they're sharing all of these really sacred things. I see three things that they share in Acts chapter two. In verse 46, we're told that day by day, they're getting together. The first sacred thing that they share with one another is their time. Your time is one of your most valuable resources. We all have the exact same amount. We can't make any more. We all have the same number of minutes in each and every day. How do we use them to build community? If you were to take out your phone and you're to open your calendar and you're looking at your next week, how many minutes in your day are, are, are spent building community? So that this time next week, you don't come in and you go, man, I've got no better community. How did you invest your time? What did it look like for you to build community? They gave their time. Secondly, we see them share their homes. Verse 46 says that they're meeting in their homes. They didn't use their homes to shut the front door and to shut the world out, but they threw open the front door and brought everybody in. That there's something meaningful and special about being in someone's home. Like you can know them from afar, but then when you're in, your, in their home, you, you see them in a unique way and in a, in a more uh, powerful and even intimate way. And Jesus is always in people's homes. Did you see that? You're reading through the New Testament, Jesus uh, eats with religious leaders at Simon's house. He eats with tax collectors and sinners in Levi's house. He eats with really close friends at Mary and Martha's house. He even invites himself over to dinner at Zacchaeus' house. Hey, by the way, Zacchaeus, you're cooking dinner for me. He's always in people's homes hanging out, sitting around tables. How, how might you share your home? You say, man, I want a biblical community. I want a revived community. What would it look like for you to open your front door, use your kitchen, use your dining room table to actually be a builder of community? Nothing magic, nothing special. Just say, hey, let's sit down. I wanna hear your story. What's God doing in your life? And that story leads to not hiding, but worship. How might you use your home? And then the third thing we see them share is their money. Verse 45 said that they sold their stuff and gave it away as people had need. Because community has this great way of so, sort of unearthing if there's any greed within us. Or said more honestly, uh, community has a, a way of unearthing the greed that is in us. Because none of us think we're greedy. It's not one of those things you're like, man, I, that's, that's the sin I struggle with for most of us. Uh, but, but we're in community and we see a need and it doesn't stir our hearts to do what we can to help meet that need, we begin to see, yeah, there is greed in me. So community is a way of drawing that out, drawing us into community to say, I have a thing, they need a thing, I'll give my thing to meet that need so that they might worship Jesus. And so they shared their time, they shared their homes, they shared their money because they were a family. That's what families do, right? If I, if I were to come and to say, guys, I'm, not gonna brag or anything, but I'm kind of godly. Let me tell you why. Uh, I let my kids share my house with me. I share my time with my wife. And y'all are like, uh, of course you do. It's your family. It's your family. You share your time and your money and your home with your family. A revived community is one that's marked by, of course I do. Of course I share my time with my community. Of course I share my, my home with my community. Of course I share my money with my community. That's what we're asking God to do, to say, God, revive us so that we are of, uh, an of course mentality to when it comes to a need in the body, to say, I'll, I'll help. I don't have everything, but I have something. I've got a couple loaves, a couple fish. What can that do? And to see God provide. Fourth and finally, we see a revived community moves from apathy to awe, from apathy to awe. Back in Genesis, one last time, Genesis chapter four, you remember that story of Cain and Abel, it's two brothers. And God comes to the one brother and says, beware, you got some anger in your heart. God says, sin is crouching at the door. It's ready to overtake you. And that brother chooses to be apathetic towards the warnings of God, he rises up and he kills his brother. See, that apathy is not a part of what a revived community looks like. Apathy means that we don't hear or care or engage. Awe is, is this sort of wonder 
It's this reverential respect. That's what awe is. Verse 43 says, everyone was filled with awe. I think about, it's hard to put my head around what awe looks like. The best I could do was when I was a kid at Christmas time, you got the lights and the tree and the presents and the songs and the, the hot chocolate. It's just this sort of everything ethos. And you're just, as, as a kid, you're just in awe. You're like, this is amazing. And then you grow up a little bit and you're like, man, now I gotta make the hot chocolate. Now I gotta put the tree in here. There's gonna be needles everywhere on the floor. I gotta put the lights on the roof. My ladder's not tall. And the awe starts come, becoming a little bit more realistic. And now it's like, oh man, it's December 23rd. I guess I ought to shop Amazon, uh, right? We, we, the awe sort of loses something. And, and church, I wonder if, if part of us doesn't show up at church losing some of that awe. I, mean, I wonder if apathy hasn't sort of settled in to say, man, I'm here, but barely. I, I'm sitting in a sanctuary or I'm watching this service, but... I'm really distracted because I'm really discouraged. Man, I get it. I get it. I went back and forth about sharing this because I feel vulnerable with it, but I figured I'd do it because, right, we're family and that's what you do. Um, one of the ways I, I process this, this sense that I have sometimes, the apathy that settles into my heart, is I like to write. I like words. And so I, I like to write poetry and prayers in that form. So there's a Sunday this summer, I was sitting right, right here and we were singing and I just wasn't there, man. I was discouraged. Um, I was distracted. You know, you're trying, you're like, oh, I hope they do a song that I like so that my heart will get in it. And I just wanted to leave. But it's awkward if the pastor leaves in the middle of the service. It's kind of like not really a thing. So I'm like, all right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it through. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this. And so I get in the car at the end of, of the, the day and I go home and I sat at my computer and I just started writing to try to process like, what is that apathy? What is that disconnect with worship? And I wrote this. So if it helps you, great. If I'm a total hack, then that's fine. Just don't tell me. Um, I wrote this. I said, I can't sing these songs that are sung. My cold heart can't move a still tongue. What do I feel if not numb? Just sounds from my mouth that is dumb. Mouth wide, but words fall like rocks. Hope is hoisted, but dryness docks. The motions can't move what is stuck. Is this a blessing or is it bad luck? Is it darkness resulting from sin? Is it deadness that's birthed from within? I need dawning light to reveal. I need a spirit to feel what I feel. Fresh wind reviving anew. Fresh faith to believe that it's you. Breathe life in this soul that is drowned. Make songs much more than a sound. Raise chorus of praise to resound from my tongue that's forever unbound. And so I share that because man, I think sometimes we find ourselves in that state of sort of apathy. And I'm asking God, would you give us awe of the gospel that you're at work would you unbind our tongues? Would you soften the hardness of our hearts? Would you bring renewal and revival uh, so that we can remember who you are and that the songs aren't just, yeah, it was fine. If someone asks you, man, how was church? You don't just say it was fine. How were the songs? They were okay. How was the sermon? Meh. But that you might say, man, I don't know. God stirred something in me. I had a conversation. I was so encouraged. God taught me something through his word that when I sang something stirred in me and I was reminded of the depth of my sin and the goodness of God's grace, that God would stir in us, not apathy, but awe. Okay, well, you might be sitting there going, man, I, I wanna be a part of a community like that. What does it look like? How, how can I practically take a next step? I wanna be in a community that I share my time and my money in my home and have awe. What does that look like? Let me give you a few things and we'll be done a few sort of real practical next steps. Let me give you five, just pick one. Just pick one to do. Number one, uh, invite people into your home for a meal. Doesn't have to be fancy. Just somebody in the community say, hey, we'd love to have you over. Love to hear your story. Love to get to know you. Number two, make it a point to meet a new person every week. If you're here on a Sunday, there's lots of new people here every single week. 
Just get to meet somebody new. And if they say, man, I've been here for 10 years, that's okay. It's better to have that one awkward conversation than to never talk to them. So just say, oh man, I I hadn't seen you before. I, I wanna... I wanna deputize each and every one of you to you are all now on our connections team. You're all a part of it. It's not the the goal of, of three or four in the foyer, it's all of us to be a part of that. Number three, join a service team. How might you use your gifts to make this church revived? to to be a welcomer, to serve kids, to serve coffee, to to be a part of creating this environment to create a hospitable place where people are known and loved. Number four, if you're not in a group, get in a group, join a group. We've got groups that meet in smaller homes all throughout Austin. So if you're in Austin, if you're in this area, then then jump into a group. We've We've got groups called missional communities, Here specifically at Northwest, we've got groups called Adult Bible Fellowships. We've got six of those groups that meet on Sunday mornings. Kids are taken care of. It's a place where you can find connection. And finally, number five, become a partner with us here at the Austin Stone. Partnership's our best effort to share life together, to share the the, the way that we uh, live in community together. Those five things, just take one step. And I'm not guaranteeing that this will be a perfect community. I'm guaranteeing that this is the means by which God will revive you. You look around, you say, God, how will you restore me? One of the means, one of the primary means is by the faces in this room. God's using us as one another to show us and to lead us and to endure us in his grace. So let's be reminded of that. Let's be thankful for the community that he's given us to the glory of his name. Let me close with this. As a prayer, 1 Thessalonians 3, 12. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all of us as we do for you so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before God, our Father. Lord, we thank you for your church. We thank you for the work that you are doing in and through us. We ask that you would help us be a part of a community where we're known, not hiding, where we're worshiping, not only because of our story, but the stories of others, that we're uh, devoted, God, and that we're finding some sense of awe in the good news of the gospel. Lord, lead us to that. Help us to, to walk in that, to enjoy that, to be blessed by it. For the glory of your name and the good of your people, we ask that in Christ's name, amen. Well, church, one of the ways that we thought we might...
right together as a body. Let's go ahead and stand and worship together. Your heart and lead me in your love to the 
So people come together, strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations, of every nation, of kingdom come. Don't let your heart be trouble and hold your head up I don't feel no evil and fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you take courage hold on be strong remember where our help comes from Children, clean hands, pure 
guys, you can have a quick seat. I've got just a few announcements um, for you. If I haven't already met you yet, my name is Amanda Brown and I serve here at our St. John congregation. I just heard a whoop, so I'm very happy about that. I'm not an Aggie, but I appreciate the, the recognition. Um, okay, so I've got a few things for you. One is, as John brought such a powerful word this morning, um, I just got a little emotional, I'm sorry. I'm so proud of you. You did a great job. <laughs> um, uh, as he, as he, he talked about reviving community, guys, we, we, it is our heart that you are plugged into a community. So if that is not your experience so far, we want to help you do that. Um, so find one of us, go to the, the connect um, table, find Didi or Wade, they're gonna be your best people to connect with um, and to find a community. Um, but while I'm at it, if you currently serve as an, a missional community leader, would you take a stand real quick? Merchants, Woo. guys, these um, these people that you have seen stand up very quickly. The merchants are are still there, like <laughs> I'm, still <laughs> I'm so happy about that. Uh, <laughs> they have um, they have been faithfully shepherding our body, uh, some of them for for many years, and. Um, and we're just really grateful for you guys. You've sacrificed your time, um, your resources, you've created safe places for people to be real and vulnerable and um, we're really grateful for you. Um, for those of you that are partners that um, have any capacity to lead a group, we need more leaders. So um, find, again, find one of us, um, find Wade, and we'll, um, we'll make sure to get, get you some good next steps on that. Um, the next thing I wanna let you know about is we're gonna be wrapping up our Reviving Love series in just a few weeks. And our, our heart is not that we're gonna just cross that finish line and move on to whatever's next, but we're gonna get to the end of that Reviving Love series. And we're going to, as a body, across all six of our congregations, stand united in prayer and ask God to really revive us to really revive our church in our city. And we're gonna do that together at Q2 Stadium on October 12th. You guys, it's incredible there. Uh, our staff team got to go a couple weeks ago and pray for the prayer night, which was really special. Um, and it's, it's gonna be a really incredible night. So you're gonna wanna make sure to do that. Um, you can pull out your phone right now and scan that QR code and uh, RSVP. Um, that's what they're doing, right? RSVPing, yes. Okay, so you're gonna RSVP so that it's gonna help us, um, it's gonna help us plan, know how many people to, to expect. Suddenly it looks like everyone's taking a picture of me. So this, this is really going very well <laughs> so far. Okay, um, now the last announcement is uh, we have our annual report um, available and ready for you to take a look at. Uh, it's available in your uh, email likely or on the website. We wanna encourage you to take a look at what God has been doing across all six of our congregations over the past 12 months. It's easy as one congregation to kind of forget that there are other congregations um, that are experiencing lots of fruit um, across our city. And so we want you to take some time to take a look at that and praise God with us for all that he's done in the past 12 months. Um, we're going to stand for a benediction. We love you church and we'll see you next week. Yeah, let's read this together as one church community this morning. Start with me in the secret places. Let repentance be as natural as breathing. Wake me up from my apathy. I just want to be caught up in the way of Jesus. We love you guys and we hope you all have a great week.